Hello again. I'm pleased to be able to share with you this time a film that really blew me away the first time that I saw it and a film that continues to impress every time I watch it. The mark of a truly great film. Uh, I think it is the best film by an internationally celebrated director and the first ever Academy Award winner for Best Foreign Film. It is La Strada from 1954. There are films that leave you wondering how they ever got made, some you wish never got made, and then there are films like this that leave you eternally thankful that they were. Films such as this need a champion, and this film has two, the husband and wife team of Federico Fellini and Giulietta Messina. Fellini's development of La Strada started with vague feelings like melancholy and a shadow of guilt, built around the story of two people who stay together in spite of the fatal consequences. During development, Fellini played with certain images, snow falling silently on the ocean, various cloud compositions, and a singing nightingale. He started to sketch these images, a habit he had learned while working in provincial music halls. Things took their final shape when he centred the story on Gelsomina, uh, a character based on Giulietta Messina, but as he had imagined her as a 10 year old. Zampano, the strong man, was based on a womanising pig castrator, someone Fellini had known in the coastal town of Rimini where he grew up. Uh, the film has a classic structure, a triangle of conflict between three main characters, Zampano, who represents earth, Gelsomina, who represents water, and Il Matto the Fool, who represents air. When reading the script for La Strada, film producer Luigi Rivera uh, began to weep, briefly raising Fellini's hopes when told that the screenplay was like great literature, but was deflated to also hear, it's not cinema. By the time it was complete, Fellini's shooting script ran to nearly 600 pages, with every shot and camera angle detailed and filled with notes reflecting intensive research. Fellini began shooting the film before any financial backers had officially signed on. Casting is central to the success of any film, and while numerous producers pushed for other actresses to play Gelsomina, Fellini would only consider Giulietta Messina for the role, especially as the character had been developed with her in mind. Despite a great deal of financial pressure, he stuck to his guns, and thankfully he did. Realistically, no one could have come close to what Giulietta brings to the screen. In 1957, several years after the film's release, Messina reportedly had received over a thousand letters from abandoned women whose husbands had to return to them after seeing this film, and that she had also heard from many people from all over the world with disabilities for whom the film had given them a new sense of self-worth. For the character of Zampano, Fellini had hoped to cast a non-professional and tested a number of circus strongmen, but to no avail. Anthony Quinn had been working on a film with Giulietta Messina when she introduced him to Fellini, and he was Im immediately convinced that the Mexican board actor would be perfect for Zampano, and after some convincing, Quinn agreed. Fellini also had trouble finding the right person for the role of Il Matto. His first choice was actor Moraldo Rossi, but Rossi wanted to be the assistant director, not a performer. Alberto Sordi, the star of Fellini's earlier films, The White Sheik and I Vitelloni, was eager to take the role, but was bitterly disappointed when rejected after a triad in costume. Fellini was particularly taken with Richard Basehart, who reminded him of Charlie Chaplin. He was offered the role and agreed to take it for much less than his usual salary, attracted by Fellini's zest for living and his humour. Production started in October of 1953, but was halted within weeks when Messina dislocated her ankle during the convent scene. Producers tried to replace her, but this changed as soon as executives at Paramount viewed the early rushes and lauded Messina's performance. When filming resumed in February of 54, it was winter. The temperature had dropped to minus five degrees Celsius, often resulting in no heat or hot water, necessitating more delays and forcing the cast and crew to sleep fully dressed and to wear hats to keep warm. Anthony Quinn, who had been signed to play the title role in the 1954 epic Attila, was forced to loose, shoot La Strada in the morning and Attila in the afternoon and evening, which meant getting up at 3.30am to capture the bleak early light that Fellini insisted on, then to leave at 10.30 to drive to Rome so he could be on set in time to transform into Attila the Hunt for afternoon shooting. This accounted for the haggard look he had in both films, a look that was perfect for Zampano, but not for Attila the Hunt. When filming continued into spring, the wintry scenes needed to be recreated by piling bags of plaster onto bedsheets to simulate a snowscape. With a tight budget, a crowd scene was created by convincing the local priest to bring the town's patron saint celebration forward by a few days to secure the presence of about 4,000 unpaid extras. What is notable about all of Fellini's films is his minute attention to detail. When selecting a box um, which Zimpano carries his cigarette butts in, uh, Fellini scrutinised over 500 boxes before finding just the right one. As for Gelsomina, 
Uh, Fellini insisted that Messina recreate the thin-lipped smile she had, he had seen in her childhood photographs. He gave her a classic bowl haircut, plastered the rest of her hair with soap to give it a spiky, untidy look, then flicked talc onto her face to give her an unhealthy pallor. He made her wear a World War I surplus cloak that was so frayed at its collar that it cut into her neck. While unhappy with her look, Armasina faithfully did as directed. It was common practice for Italian films at the time to shoot without sound, which allowed Fellini to shoot while playing taped music, something he found more stimulating. Dialogue was added later, along with musical tracks and sound effects. The cast generally spoke in their native languages or used Fellini's numerological diction. Instead of lines, the actors would count off numbers in their normal order to match the length of the actual dialogue. If you watch closely, you'll notice that mouth movements often don't match the words, and in the Italian version of the strata, there are instances when a character is heard to speak while the actor's mouth is shut tight. This method allowed Fellini films to be dubbed into any language, uh, and while it cost up $25,000 to dub La Strada into English, uh, after the film started to re receive its many accolades, it was re-released in the United States on the arthouse circuit in its Italian version using subtitles. The film premiered at the 15th Venice International Film Festival, where it began in a chilly atmosphere with an audience who seemed to dislike it, but seemed to change their opinion towards the end of the film. When the festival jury awarded La Strada the Silver Lion over Lucino Visconti's Senso, Visconti's assistant Franco Zeffirelli started blowing a whistle during Fellini's acceptance speech. A physical brawl bro then broke out, leaving Fellini shaken and Messina in tears. Some Italian reviewers saw the film as artistic, as a poem left deliberately unfinished. Some praised Fellini as a master storyteller, drawing essence and purpose from small details, subtle annotations and soft tones. Critics, however, said that after an excellent beginning, the tone became increasingly artificial and literary, the pace increasingly fragmentary and incoherent. Uh, its French release found a warmer reception, while in the UK and the US the response was mixed, with negative reviews calling it a quagmire of cheap melodrama, a director striving to be a poet when he is not, or realism crow crowing on a dunghill. But the film was also described as a deceptively simple and poetic parable. While contemporary film writers believe that La Strada was the high point of Fellini's career, Roger Ebert sees La Strada as a part of a process of discovery that led to the masterpieces La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half, and Amacord. The film's reputation has continued to grow. The BFI's director's poll ranked it fourth best of all time. It made the New York Times list of the best 1,000 movies ever made. It's on the BBC's list of the 100 greatest foreign language films, as voted by 209 film critics from 43 different countries. The film has found its way into popular music, with Bob Dylan and Chris Christopherson saying the film was an inspiration for Mr Tambourine Man and me and Bobby McGee. It won the first ever Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. It was nominated for Best Film and Best Foreign Actress for Julieta Messina at the BAFTAs. Cahiers du Cinema named it the seventh best film of 1955. The Board of Review named it the best foreign film in 1956, and it is included amongst the 1001 movies you must see before you die. Rather than list an array of reasons why you should watch this film, there's really just one. Um, it's a simple, beautiful, tragic and powerful drama that draws you in and carries you to the final devastating conclusion. It's a total film experience and this is really a film that you must see. So what I suggest you do is that you go to our website, find our virtual screenings page, find the link to, our, the link to this particular film and definitely watch it. Um, I think you'll really, really enjoy it. It's, it's, it Again, it's a, it's a gritty drama, so it can be a bit of a tough watch, but it's ultimately in incredibly satisfying. Um, but whatever you think of the film, we'd always invite you to come back. Uh, let us know what you think about this particular film, whether you'd recommend it uh, to others, um, and then we'll see you again in the not-too-distant future for another Classic Films review. See you next time.